business plans. Um, I really want to start out kind of, it almost starts out st strategic. I want, to, I want to help you think about what is your actual development strategy that you decide to pursue, and then how to write a business plan, and why are you doing it, um, rather than this is just the structure of a written business plan. Because I think uh, tomorrow afternoon you'll have your one-on-one -on -one sessions with lots of different industry people. and. I, mean, I would say, without a single exception in three years of doing this, every single one of you will have an idea, and there's four different things you could do with it, and you have no idea which is the, what is the plan you should be pursuing. Um, so I just want to give you some thoughts on, on how to get your arms around it. And, um, and then once you've had that, that's when you write your business plan. Um, so what is a business plan in the kind of physical sense? Well, it's, it's, it's a document. It's written in longhand. It's not a PowerPoint presentation. Um, eventually, you'll give it to investors to read, but they probably won't read it. Um, it really is, first and foremost, a tool for yourself and your management team. Um, it's, it's how to really articulate and, and refine and kind of keep yourself honest that you're going in the direction that you're, you're supposed to be going. Because uh, it forces you to, to lay out every element of your strategy, why you're doing it, what you're going to do, how much is this going to cost, um, and confront each of the challenges that you're going to have to face in doing it. Uh, it. It's also a living document. It's not, oh, I've done the business plan, and uh, we wrote it two years ago, where is it, and dust it off and have a look at it. it it's something you should continually update, refine, um, tear it up, start again, um, and that will continually evolve. And it's, it, as I said, it, it's really a tool for yourselves. Um, so as I said, before you can write a business plan, you've got to have a strategy. What are we actually going to do? Um, and this is quite complex. Um, so you'll hear, you know, I've heard this saying many times, and, and I've actually said it many times as well, but it's to some extent helpful, in many ways not. So. It's better to have an unmet need that you've uh, identified and then go and find the best way to solve it than to have a technology that's really interesting but is looking for an unmet need to solve, which is, makes total sense. But it never works that way because this is an extremely technical in uh, industry and you guys are technical people. You have a technology, so you are looking for the best way to um, uh, apply it in an unmet need. So you have to become a technology that has found an unmet need to solve. Um, and that is not straightforward. Um, as I said, you probably have a technology and you can do multiple different things with them. Therapeutic areas, different go-to-market strategies. Um, I I've just pulled out a kind of hypothetical example. So um, you you've, you found a mechanism within bacteria that you could exploit to kill them in their dormant phase. You know, three things I could just think of off the top of my head, you could do that. A lot of people get infections from biofilms formed on catheters. Um, a lot of people get infections during surgery. Pools of uh, dormant bacteria in their, in their kind of nasal passages can, can, can cause kind of very serious infections during surgery. Or um, a lot of the time you give broad spectrum antibiotics and it kills all the kind of very virulent um, you know, bacteria, people get better, but then they relapse two weeks later because it was laying down dormant uh, but, uh, forms of itself to kind of ride out the, uh, the kind of antibiotic and reemerge later. C. diff is an example of that. So which one am I going to do? How do we decide? The answer is a shitload of work. Um, <laughs> because you need to basically build a strategy around each one of those. Um, and then choose the one that has, in one on one axis, the most opportunity, commercial op biggest commercial opportunity, and on the other, the one that is the most deliverable. Which which do you think you can actually execute on? And and threading the needle on those two basic factors is the trick. Um, so once and then once you've um, decided, that's when you write your business plan. So what I'm going to lay out for the first bit of this lecture is, is, is how do you work out what the opportunity is? Um, and the point being, you have to do this for all of the op options. Um, you don't have to go into full detail on every single one, because some of them you may know from the get-go that they're not actually ever going to fly. So you know, 
write down a few points of why you're not going to do them, but um, you still should consider them. So how big is the opportunity? Um, the first thing to do is look at the actual market. If, if, if you're going after, if you've got a product that's um, a device that is similar to an existing kind of um, device, but yours is going to do it much better. It's going to, it's a diagnosis, it's going to, it's going to cut the time to get the readout um, by kind of several hundred percent. Um, look at what the market is. How, how many, what is the revenues of, of that industry? How many players are there? And to be honest, Google is, is you know, I, I use Wikipedia for kind of 90% of my searching. Um, um, I probably shouldn't admit that. Um, but yeah, just go out and find how big is the market. Um, you can buy, um, you can pay for published public um, market research. Um, so that's, but they're quite expensive, but actually Google will probably give you most of what you need. And you can verify it and refine it if that's the type of business you've got. It's better than something else, so the existing market is out there, and, and, and that's really, your plan is go and take market share from those guys. That's how big your, you know, what, what they're doing is your opportunity. Problem is, the reason you're in this room is because most of what you're doing is not, is not an evolution on what's been done before. You're really trying to do something completely different. And, you know, if there is an unmet need, the market may not exist. Um, you know, the, the, the infection example I just gave, you know, if you try to look at a particular population of patients, how much money gets put into therapeutics, it will probably be tiny because it's all broad spectrum antibiotics. They cost 50 cents a pill. So the market is going to be tiny. But if you can produce a therapeutic that, you know, solves the problem and delivers real value, and we talked about, um, we talked about um, reimbursement earlier, and um, we mentioned just on the last panel um, this kind of cost-benefit element. If you're delivering real, real value, you can charge hundreds or thousands of dollars for your drug, and the market has totally changed in structure. Um, so what we have to do is assess the fundamentals of the opportunity you're trying to, to go after. So the first thing we need to do is um, you know, um, drill down into how big is the population who are going to benefit from this. Then we'll talk about how much we can charge per person, and then you multiply, and then how much of that market you can get. You add those, multiply those three together. That's your opportunity. Um, so, how big is the relevant population in that antibiotic um, uh, example? It's not how many people get infected with the disease. That is not the population. It's not the population who, how many people get a research, recurrent disease either. It's those who get the infection, get the recurrent disease, get given antibiotics, and are still suffering uh, severe um, morbidities, aren't getting better. Those, that is really your opportunity. Um, and that's a small number of patients relative to, percentage-wise, to the actual population. It, uh, in C. diff, which was what I had in mind, it's probably kind of somewhere between 2 and 5% um, of the population. Um, so bear that in mind. Um, that's the, that is the population you're giving value to. And, and that's not obvious, necessarily, to be honest, to, st to start with. Um, then how much value are you delivering? And that depends on what, the, what are the consequences of those patients, do they die when they're not responding? Are they in bed for a month? Um, do they have long-term kidney issues? Um, yeah, I say more days in the ICU. Or do they spend a week in bed and they get, get better? So it's a you know, week of time. So what, assessing what is the, the consequence of the unmet need will de depend, determine the value you are delivering as well. So how much can you charge for your, for your product? And that all depends on how much benefit you're delivering. As I said, are, you, are all patients, you know, that 2%, are all of them immediately cured when they take your drug? Are 20% cured? Are all of them responding and they get better by 20%? Those are things that you need to kind of, will end up being measured and your pricing will be determined by that. So when you're talking about benefit that you're bringing, you're talking about it always has to be relative to the treatments that are already being given to patients, and probably more relevant, the treatments that are in development and are ahead of you. 
and you have to always be thinking about um, how am I better, not does my does my product work. Um, so this is um, this is a Kaplan Ma curve of, of um, for oncology. So this is there's two treatment arms here. This is you know what was the standard of care. These are months time of survival. I think it's progression free survival along the bottom, and this is percentage of patients along the y-axis. So this was standard of care. This is a new type of drug. It's actually quite straightforward. You measure the area that's the difference between these two lines. That is the value in terms of survival that you are bringing a population. So how do we translate that into, into value? Um, I mean, it, there are different dynamics that, that impact on the real world, but analytically, you heard um, uh, Devon mention qualies um, early, earlier. I didn't, he didn't really go into them. Um, and I'm from the UK, so we have um, the NHS that look at this in a very um, rigorous way. And I'm not sure I entirely agree with how they apply it. And different healthcare systems um, operate differently, but the concepts are the same. So um, on the left here, you, you've got survival, which is cancer, which is obvious. You, if you're alive, you're alive. And if you're dead, you're dead. And actually, you'd rather be alive. So that's the value you're bringing. So, um, so a quality, it stands for quality of life year. If you're um, running around um, happy and feeling healthy, you have a quality of life of one. If you're dead, you have a quality of life of zero. And there are, um, there are metrics, questionnaires, there's all kinds of different ones that basically ask the patient, you know, assess the patient on what is their quality of life. You know, if they're bedridden, it's for, you know, chronically bedridden, chronically in pain, they may be alive, but their quality of life may be kind of 20%. Uh, if, if you if you've got um, if you're getting kind of migraines periodically, you, you might be 98%. Um, um, so this is a this is a non um, uh, kind of fatality driven um, treatment. You've got no treatment, and I don't want, I've no idea what this is. Let's call it a bad case of flu. Um, so they're bedridden and feeling like absolute crap for you know s seven weeks. Eventually, they get better, and then they're back to 100%. And then you've got two treatments. The first, A, where they spend two weeks sick, but then the drug kicks in, and they get back to 100%. And then treatment B, where they um, they respond a little bit to start with, but they don't, it takes a longer time to get better, and then they get better. So the question is, how much is that worth? And this is just the analytical approach, which is, um, NICE, which is the kind of gatekeeper for the NHS, they say they will charge up, they will pay up to £30,000 a year per quality. Um, and as I said, I don't really agree with how they apply it, but the basic principle does intuitively make sense. And so all they do is you say, okay, so you've got weeks along the X, on the X axis and you've got quality of life on the Y. You basically measure the area under the graph between the blue line and each of these dotted lines. And you basically just say, what is that area times 30,000? And you get treatment A is worth 1,800, and treatment B is worth 1,700. So that's what that treatment's worth. The problem with NICE is that they will then absolutely say that's the answer, and you probably want 5,000. and. It ends up being a bit of a mess. But um, in principle, that is an, a pretty um, intuitive an, an analysis of cost benefit to the patient um, before you get into does it save the healthcare system anything. Yeah, so other ways to get your arms around how much I can charge for my drug. Look at similar drugs on the market. As I said, sometimes you, the market doesn't exist, but if they do, how much are they being, how much are they uh, are selling for? Um, uh, this is more of a kind of sense check health healthcare system analysis. If you've got, um, you can do this fundamental analysis, and if you if you view that you know you've cured, you've intervened early in a diabetic patient, and they're now you know, you, you, re, you divert them away from um, disease progression and you run, therefore, they get kind of 40% extra quality of life for the next 
uh, 60 years and you do that analysis times 30,000 a year, you end up at a price, excellent, that's what I can get. The problem is if everybody had diabetes was paying that, you'd bankrupt the entire healthcare system. So you've got to kind of temper it with some reality. Um, and then how is it actually going to get used? Because if it's, an, if it's an acute therapeutic, if it's someone who is very sick, you give them the drug and they get better, then that patient is getting the direct benefit of that drug. You can pay the direct, you, you can extract the, the direct value of that drug. If it's chronic, uh, for the long term in their kind of quality analysis, um, because if they were going to die versus survive, that's quite a lot of value you've just d um, delivered. If it's a chronic therapeutic where you're delivering it on a daily basis until they progress or they get cycled off it, well, the price per dose is going to be based on, to be honest, the price per d the value per day you're given. So it's it's going to end up being lower, even though the total amount added up over time uh, might be similar. Or if it's a prophylactic. So if you're um, dosing the whole population of anyone who gets a bacterial infection and that recurrent population is only 2%, you know, you've calculated what the value to that 2% is and it's quite large, but you're dosing prophylactically. So you have to spread that value across the entire population you're giving. So ultimately you can't get away from, you have to work out what is the value of delivering to the patients who's going to benefit, and then that will de determine what is the price per um, treatment, device, digital health, um, sync to your iPhone, whichever. Cost saving analysis, yeah, so then there's the other, which is the, the easiest way to extract money from someone, which is saving them money. So especially in digital health, if you're taking, um, taking costs out of the um, uh, uh, bed, bed man patient bed management system, if you're kind of freeing up 10% of extra beds by making it efficient, you know, that's core value you're creating, direct cash into the pockets of hospitals. If you lay that, lay that analysis out, it's, it's a very easy, um, it's not easy to get the, get the revenue, but it's at least it's a, a very straightforward argument to make. Um, and then finally, cost-based pricing. So if anybody went to business school, this is kind of 101, never do it. Um, so how much is it going to cost you to make your drug? How much margin do I think I need to make? Oh, I want to make a 20% margin, add 20% to it. That's the price I can charge because that's the margin I want. What happens is, you know, one small assumption in your analysis goes wrong and, um, and, and now your margin is, is gone to zero. So never do that. But it's worth working out what your, um, what your drug's going to cost to make. Okay, um, so that's the, that's the value your drug can bring to a patient. That's the price you think trans, you tr can translate into per patient. Um, you know how many patients th th there are. So that's the market opportunity. How much are you going to kind of anticipate you're going to be able to access? Um, don't ever say there's no treatment for these patients. I've got a treatment that's going to cure them and therefore I should have 100% of that market times my price per drug, and that's my analysis. You will never get anywhere near 100% of the market, um, unless you're a genetic disease and there's 12 of these patients, you might, you might get those. Um, you know, but you, you lose credibility when you talk to investors by saying something like that. So, so I would say your base case, layer in 20%, maybe 50% if it's a small, um, if it's a small and totally unexploited market. So you add all that up, you've done all that work, and that's the size of the opportunity. Um, so is that the one you should choose? You, you know, choose the biggest. The problem is different uh, opportunities have different challenges in executing on them. So now you've got a lot more work to do, which is how do I actually deliver this? Um, you know, some markets are more competitive and harder to access. Going up against GE or IBM is going to be very hard because they're, uh, you know, incumbent in the market. If you try to encroach, if you've got a kind of new imaging technique, um, these guys, uh, uh, GE, kind of between GE and kind of three other guys, they own the market. If you move, try and move in, they'll just squash you, um, basically. Um, I'm not saying you can't do it, but it, it's a real challenge. Um, um, 
cheap generics, antibiotics, very difficult because if you're trying to, if you're a healthcare system, you're making the choice between a new antibiotic that's going to cost $10,000 or there's five different types of antibiotics that cost 50 cents. Very difficult to, to kind of switch that um, uh, behavior. Um, so it's all to do with how much better can you be than uh, the existing products on the market, um, which is most of these markets are pretty crowded, so you have to be a lot better. Um, and when you're considering how crowded it is, don't just think about in the context of the type of technology you're delivering. So if, you're, if you've got a novel take on a TNF inhibitor, um, you know, it's not who else is going after the same target. It's not just people who are going after the same pathway. It's not people who are using small molecules or large molecules to that pathway. It's also kind of other approaches that are relevant in kind of immune, immune related diseases or inflammation related to, to diseases. There could be devices, there could be diagnostics that pick up the situation three years before they need your type of treatment. Lifestyle choices, all of these things you are competing against. And so again, never turn up to an investor and say, there's no competition. There is always competition. You either haven't done enough work to find it or you haven't thought about it, thought creatively enough. Oh yeah, so, so, so and, and, um, and things that are being developed at the time are, comp are probably your most you know, scariest competition because they themselves are going after the market, assuming they're gonna be better than what's on market. And build, when you think about your plan, build integrating competitive technologies in a head-to-head -head fashion into everything that you do. Because, you know, I don't care how many mice you can cure. I want to show that you can cure them a lot better than anything else that's out there. Um, start with the peak market sales. Um, we, sh we showed earlier in a presentation that, you know, um, I think it was a diagnostic that took seven years to get to peak market sales. So st start there. How are you going to get there and how challenging, what are you going to need to do to get ramp up? So you're going to have to fight competition. You're going to have to engage with, um, are, are you going to be immediately global product? A drug is pretty global immediately. Are you versus a, health, a digital health where you've probably got to build up a local franchise and then expand outwards? Um, you know, how, how costly is it going to drive to, uh, peak market sales, are you going to have to build a huge manufacturing sales force infrastructure or if it's a digital health, it's pretty you know, um, cheap to reach everybody. Um, so what are the challenges? Is, is the actual commercial market going to be hard or easier? A lot of the time if you've got a drug and you're first to market and it's you know, curing patients, it should actually be um, uh, it's it's not easy at all, but in theory, it should be easy to kind of get 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 rolled out quickly because everybody wants your product. Um, what is required to get to the market approval? Some indications, some strategies around a particular technology will ultimately require 15,000 patients in phase three. Others might only need 30, 30 patients in fast track designation, and we talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, so if you're starting out today, which one would you rather do? Well, there are other considerations, but the orphan track is a much easier path to go down. Um, uh, devices 510K, are you, are, you gonna, are you substantially equivalent? See, I was right, it was SE. Substantially equivalent to something else, in which case you don't really need to engage too heavily in a regulatory process, or PMA, where basically you have to do the equivalent of a, of a say, basically doing the same as the drug guys. Um, you know, one application of your technology may uh, lean towards regulatory light, another regulatory heavy, and you have to decide which one um, is more deliverable from your perspective. Um, you know, in digital health, you you might it might be a kind of direct to consumer market, and all you need to do is launch uh, launch a website and post some things on the side of Facebook. Um, but actually, it might be. Um, you're, you're selling into hospitals as opposed to patients and to convince hospitals to buy it you need to actually effectively run a multi-center trial uh, that's kind of con rigorously controlled as though it was a regulatory trial 
because you need that bo body of evidence to convince the buyers who are the, the hospitals to, to, uh, to take up your product. Um, and it could be the same digital health platform with different strategies. Um, you know, exit, where do you, your investors will likely be the type of people who want an, an exit at some point. Um, so where do you think you need to get to? If I was starting a therapeutic company today, I would always say, you know, you can, plenty of companies exit earlier, but you've got to be in for the long haul and uh, phase two proof of concept data is, is where you have to have the stomach to get to. Um, devices and diagnostics and digital health, it used to be kind of five, 10 years ago when, especially with the, as Ilan said, moving from the 510K to the PMA process, you know, all I need to do is show that my device worked, that it was safe. I mean, it's a, it's a, if it's a diagnostic, it's gonna be safe, but if it works, um, and then lots of people are gonna buy it and it's much cheaper and lower risk than drugs. Actually, what happened was the regulatory landscape shifted, but then kind of even more challenging, the exit market shifted. So I'm not, if I'm a, if I'm, um, Roche will tell you that they don't do it this way, but they do, they're a big diagnostic player. They actually wanna see adoption. They want, they want you to have shown that not only do you have a device that works or a diagnostic that works, but that actually people are going to use it and pay you for it. And so they're gonna wait until you've got 20 million of EBITDA before they buy you. And that's a really challenging thing because you, know, you, you have to turn overnight from a technology company into a commercial company. And that's a very difficult structural change that your organization is gonna to have to go through. So you need to be planning for that and factoring that into your, into your strategy. And buyers, number of buyers. If there, is, if there are 20 people and they're all desperate for the type of technology that you, you're selling, you know, you're going to be able to drive an auction and end up with a, a very healthy outcome. If there's only two guys in the space, you know, actually the same technology could be just as valuable from an intrinsic point of view, but you'll, um, you know, the value you sell the company for, I promise you will be orders of magnitude less. Um, you know, and, and do they specifically have any cash? What's their own situation at the moment? Are they out buying actively? That's good if they are. If sometimes a lot of companies go through cycles where they're not. Um, look at comparable co uh, technologies that have exited as well. That will help give you a benchmark. Um, the other thing to say is uh, when it comes to exit uh, is that a lot of people only see as far as where they think they'll be able to exit at. So, um, um, with say with a drug at phase two, okay, anything that happens beyond phase two is not my problem. It's going to be the pharma company's problem. Unfortunately, it is your problem because when they look at you, as I told you before, everything that's happened in the past is irrelevant. They're only looking at the future. So you have to have already solved all the problems that they're going to have to deal with in the future for them because, and that, because that's what they're buying. So peak market sales is actually what you need to be thinking about. Okay, uh, we talked about regulatory path. Um, if you, we mentioned it anyway. So if you've got something where it's totally novel, so if I'm de uh, developing, um, you know, a few years ago, no one had really put gene therapy through a regulatory path. Cell therapy um, in cancer is now emerging. Regu uh, in regenerative medicine, cell therapy still hasn't really taken off. So if I'm looking down the barrel of do I want to, this, this, this technology is fantastically exciting and has great implications on regrowing um, your pancreas for diabetes, that's great. But if, if um, no one has ever walked that regulatory path, the FDA has never seen a technology, it's gonna take forever to convince them or for you all to agree what are the right trials, what are the endpoints, how much preclinical safety you'd need to do. So that in itself is intrinsically more risky. Um, uh, I talked about the size of um, trials before. Um, you know, clinical risk, <coughs> different indications, different settings. Um, uh, sepsis is a great example of where, you know, lots of people can simulate a sepsis situation in a mouse and rescue the mouse and no one has produced a sepsis drug ever um, because you wrap a patient around it and the patient variability kills, kills it. Um, there are too many things going on in the clinical setting. So 
therefore developing drugs in sepsis has been a bit of a graveyard. Um, I have a sepsis company, by the way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You know, recruitment challenge. There are some for various reasons. One, you know, the best market might be, you know, uh, newborn children. It's very difficult to, to, well, just convince parents to put experimental drugs in their newborn children, and to, re to convince the regulators that you should be able to do that. So that's that's gonna that's gonna be a challenge. Um, competition as well. So. Rheumatoid arthritis, for example, I have no idea how many trials, but there's, you know, must be somewhere between close to 100 trials at any given moment going on in RA. Um, trying to get access and recruit those patients into your trials, again, is, is, is challenging, and that will impact, is it deliverable, and does your trial take five years when actually, in theory, you were hoping it was going to take 18 months? And there might be other indications you could take your... Um, your, your, your your device or um, drug into um, safety risks obviously um, and then tr well, translatability into into humans um, for all the uh, challenges in antibiotics and infectious diseases actually most models do translate pretty well into humans because you're actually it's the bug you're killing. So in your model, you're actually killing the thing that you're trying to kill when you put it into humans. Um, other diseases, neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's, Parkinson, it's a complete nightmare. You, you, you know, this mouse stops shaking. Um, you, put a, you put it into hu human and actually kind of the, the mechanism may bear no relation to what's going on in the, in the patient. So again, are there validated, well uh, models that translate? Those are other, that's another consideration for you. Direct to consumer. A lot of products actually that uh, we've had in one start, you know, face this question. There are, if it's a device, if it's a diagnostic, is it a home, you know, at home um, uh, test for STDs or um, um, th where, it doesn't really require that much regulation, and therefore, do you bother with the regulation or do you go straight to consumer? The challenge, the great thing is, it avoids all the pain of going through the regulation, but, and it's quick, um, but you generally get lower, lower pricing for it. It's much lower barrier to entry. That, that approval, basically, is painful, but it also it puts off other people trying to do it. So um, uh, it, it'll increase, naturally increase um, competition uh, and then technology just the, the technical risk of what it is you're you're trying to do so if you've um, you know you got the biology risk you got the chemistry risk toxin safety formulation you know getting the drug or the or the or the device to, to kind of get the drug or whatever it is you're trying to do um, engineering if you're yeah there's a couple of companies I think doing prosthetic um, uh, devices that they're not straightforward and then software that's probably one way or another if you put enough time and smart people at the software one programming one way or another you can you can solve that so when you're starting out and you're you're wrapping this analysis around um, your ideas you know what evidence do you have and you're communicating to investors what evidence do you have either direct because you've done some experiments with data or indirect because you can pull in rationale from you know su such and such paper said this and therefore that implies that or product a has already demonstrated a link between these two conditions um, so how can you build an argument that de-risks these technical questions um, then there's management you know certain as I talked about with devices if you if you really are going to have to show 20 million of EBITDA does anybody, is everybody around the uh, table a science geek? Um, are you really the management team that's going to go in that direction? Um, do you have the technical skills? You may be kind of a wonderful group of um, biologists, but really you, you want to start drugging something that needs a load of chemistry. Um, can you fill those gaps with other people um, that not only have the technical skills, but work well with the team? We heard about some of that before. Um, and then this is another thing that Elan mentioned earlier, which is you may be the right team today, but you may well not be further down the track. And you know, we just have to be grown ups and accept that. And then financing. <sighs> Always comes down to financing. Um, you, certain ones, certain of those opportunities will take 
exponentially more amounts of financing and some of them will take less. Um, some of them, you know, if it's a direct cons to consumer um, non-regulatory product, whether it's digital health, whether it's a device, may only take a few million dollars to get up and running and get cash flow into the business. In which case, you know, your buddy's uncle is really interested in your idea and you've got that ready to go. To be honest, that's not a bad reason to make that decision if it's deliverable and the opportunity is there. If um, you're going after a much bigger um, opportunity and it's going to take hundreds of millions and, and five to eight years, that, that tells you you're going to need uh, VCs to start with and ultimately probably industry partners or, or industry partners up front. You know, if you've run around and that, that is just not available um, for whatever reason, well, you may have to switch the opportunity you execute on. Um, these two points about managing investor dynamics, I think we'll talk about that tomorrow instead. Um, okay, so, so you've now done that analysis for all five of your potential things you could do with your technology, and you've decided that you've decided on the one that's the biggest opportunity where you've managed to get yourself comfortable that you can deliver all of, through, you know, navigate your way through all of those um, challenges. Um, so what are you going to do? Um, you've, you've done a lot of the work around the broad, big picture, long term, um, what needs to get done. But now you've got to actually get specific about what it is you're going to do. Someone's going to give you money and, that's, and, and you need to communicate um, what you're going to spend their money on and, and why you're going to do this. Um, we mentioned the killer experiment. Um, what, so, we talk about milestones. There's a number of ways you can talk about milestones. Milestone being uh, an air, a place you need to reach that's a significant um, um, achievement. And we, I also mentioned the word value inflection point. Um, so, what that will be is, uh, you know, you've uh, run your trial and you know patients get better or you've cured a, a kind of particular model. What you have to do when you're thinking about what it is, what model or trial you're going to run is only bother doing the one that is the most difficult. Um, we call it the killer experiment because you know that if you can't uh, make that experiment a success, your technology is dead. Too many people end up doing the easy experiment. The first five things that they do are the ones where there's no head-to-head -head with another product. Um, it's, a, you know, it's a mouse that's easy to cure, whatever it is. And they spend three years doing this analysis, you know, kind of building up what they think is a really positive um, uh, data package around their technology. And then finally, they're forced to do the hard experiment and it fails. So why bother? Just go straight for the hardest thing you can possibly think of and run it. And if it doesn't work, we talked about the billion dollars required to make it worth bothering at all. It's only going to be worth a billion dollars if it's better than everything out there. And if you can't make it better than anything, everything out there in a preclinical setting, you're never going to make it work in a patient. So killer experiment. Um, you know, and try, again, try and... Try and um, layer on as much real world context as you can. I, I've seen so many um, technologies that are quite are pretty interesting and they put them, put them into these models and even you, you know even for the drug is interesting and the model is challenging they give the drug and they seed the, ca the mouse with cancer or they dose the antibiotic and they infect the mouse at the same time. Humans don't get the drug the same time they get cancer. They're kind of, you know, they're metastatic by the time they turn up to the hospital. And they're kind of, f have four days worth of debilitating um, um, flu before they turn up to the hospital. So, you know, it, just small things, like to think about what happens in the real world. How am I trying to de-risk what my drug will be doing in the real world? Make your preclinical models as close to that as possible. And then, work out what is the time and the cost to do that, and that's what you're communicating with the investment community because that's what they're paying for. Um, if it works, what's the next killer experiment? 
That's it. It's as simple as that. And that may be, you know, I'm not talking about expect killer experiments being um, just in vitro, in vivo models. Killer experiment is a clinical trial. It could be a, um, um, uh, a paid for trial with your hospital customers. Um, just one small note on experiments I wanted to mention is um, the best experiments are really only designed to answer a single question. You can build other things into, into them to learn ancillary things, but you, know, you want to think about what is, the, what is it I want to know from this? Is, is my drug getting where it needs to be? Um, you know, what is the right dose? Uh, if, if I design my experiment to specifically answer that, like a phase 2B trial is about finding the right dose, I will, I will have, if it fails, I'll know that I don't have the right dose. If I'm just putting it into approximately the right um, area and hoping to learn as much as I can, it may fail, but I don't know why it failed, and now I've got to run an experiment to work out why it failed. Um, so try and organize your thinking around single questions and learn, you know, pick up other stuff along the way, but it has to be, there has to be a primary endpoint. So now you have your strategy. You know what unmet need you're going to solve. You know what you need to achieve to get all the way through to peak market sales. You've thought about what is my exit route and my exit point. Um, you know which type of person and at the start which actual people are going to be needed at which point along that journey. Um, and you know how much cash you're going to need to run this series of killer experiments. And therefore, that leads you to which investors are going to, um, you're going to reach out to. So now you can write your business plan. So do all that work first, then write your business plan. Don't start drafting yet. Um, different people will have slightly different nuances on how they like things structured. I mean, this is just a guide. So um, these are the, the sections that I think should probably be in there. The executive summary is just a very concise um, uh, summary of what it is you're about, to, what you're going to uh, talk about in your plan. You should write it last, because um, if you write it first and try and fit the rest of it to re meet the summary, you'll find it it has um, morphed in the wrong direction. Your opening statement, and this is this is um, applies to your two-minute pitch, your elevator pitch as well. It should always just come in a very straightforward format. I'm raising a million dollars to fund development of X to do Y in order that Z. It's just that simple. So I've given you a couple of uh, examples. Raising a one million seed round to fund development of a prescription processing platform to reduce the complexity in the prescription process in order to reduce the time it takes a patient to receive their medicine, reduce errors, and cost in the healthcare system. So if you just stick with that as a format, you'll get, you know, you, you will be able to communicate what it is you're trying to achieve in a single sentence, even if it's a bit of a wordy one. Um, okay, management team, uh, make sure you list the most relevant experience, not the whole life story um, of, your, of each of your team members. Outline what their role is going to be and why their, those experiences are relevant for that role. Also include everybody else you've managed to kind of accumulate to be friends of the company whether that's a formal scientific advisory board, a formal board, mentors, friends you meet at one start who are you know, helping with the company. Because they're all, you know, one way or another, part of what it is an investor's buying into. So the opportunity, um, you've already done a lot of the work here, outline the unmet need. Um, you need to adjust for the audience a little bit. Um, I don't need to know, be told that the healthcare system is stretched, budget is stretched. I don't know, need to know that lots of people die of cancer. So don't spend kind of pages on, on those subjects. If you're talking to a VC, if you're talking to angels, maybe it's more, worth more time. Um, uh, talk to, get primary resources, talk to KOLs and, 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 and people who are actually on the ground doing this to bolster your um, kind of in a, in a vacuum McKinsey type analysis. Sorry. Um, uh, and and don't, don't lose credibility by overstating what it is you, you've done or you're doing. You know, you know, I'm telling you aim for curing cancer, but don't claim it up front because no one will believe you. Um, under promise, over deliver. That's my, that's my uh, 
<laughs> advice on that. I will, we will be the Facebook of digital health. Yeah, you know, it's it, you, you, no one's, people will turn off as soon as you've said that. Um, technology, what is it? How is it going to address the, the unmet need and how is it differentiated? Not different, how is it differentiated from everything else? Um, we have a thing called a target product profile. It's quite a useful tool to really focus what it is you're trying to achieve. Uh, this is from the FDA website. It's just an example. I think it's in pain. Um, it just lays out what is the place, what is the patient's population you're going for, um, and what is the efficacy level that you're going to um, produce side effects. You know, are you, are, is your is your drug going to reduce side effects? Is that what you're going to try and do? Is it going to increase efficacy? Uh, is it going to change it from once from every day to once a month dosing? And this is something that you should have fixed in your mind from day one to allow you to design all your killer experiments to pick off all of the elements in your target product profile. Uh, data. Don't be afraid of getting detailed. We buy into data. Um, but make sure you are presenting it in a way that's not just a data dump. You are crafting a story to explain why what you are claiming you can do, you can do. and and. And again, just putting in graphs that are poorly labeled and you're not explaining the implications, you're just expecting the reader to have made the jump. You've been working, living and breathing this stuff, they don't know. You need to, it's a, it's a story you're telling, it's, it's not a, um, you know, it's also not a scientific research paper. The language is different. So have some sympathy with the reader. Um, Work plan, again, you've done this work now, so it's now translating it into it, in, into just into prose. Um, you, you, the killer experiment or the key milestone is the most important point, but also you need to think about what will be done in parallel while you're waiting for that killer experiment to be done that will unlock the next phase of development because you don't want to just do the experiment and now need you, realize you have to spend 12 months waiting for more drug product to come, come along. Um, and, and what is, this is where I talk about what is your long-term kind of exit strategy or partnering strategy for the business. You know, there is, a, there is a seamless development path for this technology all the way through to peak market sales, but that doesn't mean you plan to be the one running it or the investors funding it all the way through to that. So what, is, what do you think is your anticipated strategy? We're doing early partnerships, are we going to fund it all the way ourselves? Budget. You know, be quite detailed about what you're going to be spending your money on, especially in the first 12 months. Um, Gantt charts, I don't think I've ever seen a presentation without a Gantt chart, um, or at least one I opened. Um, uh, so kind of give a workflow. Cash flow projections, you know, you've raised $2 million. When am I going to run out of money based on this work plan with this budget that, where all the items are going to cost this much? Um, and then longer term, building out to you know commercialization, you don't. You also need a, a Gantt chart with buckets of expected financing, but you don't need it to be in as much detail. Uh, risks. Um, I get a bit militant about this, but I make all of my companies have a risk schedule that we present at every board meeting, which is here is a list of twenty things that could go wrong. Um, and if they do go wrong, what are we going to do about it? And who have we, you know, what things have we already put in place so that we minimize the time and the cost implications of one of those things going wrong? So in your plan, lay out the key risks that you see with the kind of the workflow of what you're going to, um, uh, what you're raising money for, and try to show how you've mitigated for some of those risks. And some of them will be just, well, the technology may fail, but you know, still write it as a risk. And, and so when it does fail, at least you can tell your investors, I told you so. Um, have a section on competition. Never say there is no competition. There's always competition. What's on the market today? How are patients being treated today? What's in development? I talked about other forms of competition that's not just people who are thinking about life the same way as you. Um, and how will you be different or better than all of those um, technologies at address addressing the unmet need? 
Um, intellectual property, you summarize where you are with that. Um, you know, have you filed? Have you, have you, uh, are you using composition of matter, which is you know, the actual technology you own? Is it a method of use patent? Or is it just kind of proprietary know-how? Um, we talked about freedom to operate. Freedom to operate it, that's a typo. Um, and then what other forms of barrier to entry do you have? Are you first to market? Are you, um, is it proprietary know-how? No one else knows how to do it. You can't patent it, but um, that's, uh, you know, that will protect your technology. And then finish with the conclusion, which is effectively this, the, a repeat of the execu executive summary, just kind of tweak the words. Um, so in effect, tell them what you're going to tell them. That's the executive summary. Tell them that's the body of your business plan and tell them what you've just told them. And then they might remember it um, if they read it. Um, add some extra stuff into the appendix. So that is what we want you to go and write, your business plan. Um, but as I said at the start, um, it's really a tool for you and your management team to keep as a living document so that you all know where you're going. Um, as I said, many of them will never get re read, potentially the executive summary. And that's because investors usually, when you're communicating with the outside world, you will be presenting a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and then after that, they don't say, okay, let's read your business plan. They ask you lots of specific questions and you will then go ahead and answer them. And it's, it's much more of a face-to-face -face interactive um, uh, uh, process. But the business plan und is underlying everything that goes into this presentation. It's basically the same structure. You're cutting and pasting different bits of it. You're tailoring it for different, um, different audiences. But one way or another, you, f you have to keep your business plan up to date, and then that will inform on the presentations you're giving in your pitches. Um, you should also have, in the presentations, you should have a 30-minute version, a 60-minute version, and a 90-minute version. And you should practice these. Um, and everybody in the, in the uh, company should have a two-minute elevator pitch, which is the first sentence or few sentences in your executive summary. And every single person should have them memorized off by, uh, by heart. 